Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming here. Uh, very, very excited to see everybody. Uh, I have a couple of quick announcements to make before we get started. I'm super excited about this talk. We're uh, looking forward for something like this uh, for a long time. So, I appreciate you coming. Um, so, the first thing we will normally do is. Uh, so yeah, so just as the disclaimer, we are going to record this and post it on our YouTube channel. Uh, so as long as you stay not here, you will not be on camera. But if you ask a question, your voice will be heard. So just keep that in mind. Um, the way we'll structure this. Hey, Mariana, you've come down if you want to do the acknowledgement. Yeah. Um, the way we'll structure the day here is we'll start with um, Michael's talk, you know, probably half hour or so, Q&A. Um, actually, uh, Michael, I don't know if you would like to do questions in the middle or afterwards if you thought about it or not. Decide now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so then we'll do, uh, then right after any Q&A in the talk, we do breakout small groups, like five, six people each. We usually like to allocate, dedicate 20 minutes to that. It's good to get people to get to know each other, really. And then as you kind of, you know, as the topics kind of fall apart, you can kind of just break up as you want. If you want to keep going for, talk for an hour, I'm not going to stop you. And then, you know, you just kind of hang. The food's here for anyone to have whenever they want. And uh, yeah, we'll just hang out until, until whenever. So that's kind of the structure. You can ask them. Um, this is like my first time at the um, I'd like to like maybe hear a little bit about what I'm actually Yeah. I think that, uh, oh, I think when I introduce Michael, I will give a little bit okay. of that. So I, that's what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so let's see what else. So uh, we've been doing name tags lately. I think it's really helpful for folks. So if you can get one, get one. That's great. They're right over here. I haven't put mine on yet. Uh, just to start. Um, so that's nice. Also, if you are not aware, we have a group chat uh, on, a, on an app called Discord. It's a place where people can hang out, ask more questions, get to know each other. We also do a lot of like uh, kind of unofficial events. Really, the, the meetups we really just do the, the monthly events, but people get together for hikes. Um, there was a group of folks that uh, just came back from Burn in the Forest, Shambhala, other festivals. We kind of organize over there, and uh, you know, so we do a lot of un unofficial hangs there, get together for going to the beach, whatever. So if you want to keep in touch with everyone, it's a really nice place to be and hang out. Also, I really want to encourage this one. Um, we put out an anonymous feedback form to ask folks to kind of give any feedback, suggestions. Obviously, you don't have to be anonymous. We've gotten basically no responses on it. And so we would love to hear good, bad, indifference, suggestions, complaints, improvements, whatever it is. Uh, we'd love to hear from anyone. So uh, I think in the meetup, group itself and every time I mail out there's always a, there's usually a link to that and it's in the discord if you can't find it let me know because I may have made a mistake on sending out properly so um, yeah we'd love to hear back because again this is for you we do it for you and we'd love to just make that as good as possible so um, Marina if you want to yeah. do the land acknowledgement and then we'll do the full you are unrecognizable before <laughs> unrecognizable like where the hell is he okay <laughs> acknowledges that it is situated on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. This place is the unceded and ancestral territory, oh I just said that, um, and has been stewarded by them since time immemorial. Vancouver is located on territory that was never ceded or given up to the crown by the Musqueam, Squamish, or Tsleil-Waututh peoples. The term unceded acknowledges the dispossession of the land and the inherent rights that the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh hold on to hold to the territory. The term serves as a reminder that Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh have never left their territories and will always retain their jurisdiction and relationships with the territory. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited today about having Michael here to speak with us. Um, you know, he's kind of a heavyweight in the Vancouver psychedelic scene, been around a long time. I'll give a little background, but you can always add more if you want when you get up here, Michael. But, um, you know, I think Michael's, you know, kind of history of psychedelics, at least that I'm aware of, is he started organizing in the, uh, the UBC Psychedelic Society. And then uh, after graduating, he became 
full time and was volunteering with Maps Canada, but then became full time uh, as a volunteer coordinator for Maps Canada, which is really amazing. And that's how, how I really got to know him uh, well, well uh, when, uh, as a volunteer there. And uh, now he is kind of fully devoted to uh, the Flying Sage, which is what we're going to hear a lot about today, and his own kind of journey work, uh, which, we'll, which we'll hear about uh, today as well. And I think the, the main reason why I'm uh, so excited about having Michael here is because a lot of folks, especially new people, come to me and others in the group looking for a guide, right? It's the two biggest requests we get is where can I get drugs and how do I find a guide? <laughs> uh, and uh, so, and it's a very difficult thing. Like it's something that, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those things as you kind of hang in the community and get to know people, you kind of just get to meet people. and. But as a new person, it can be difficult. I was in this scenario myself. I was interested in it. It took me a long time to, to kind of find out, you know, to find people to work with. You know, I was back back out in the East Coast, and you know, eventually I did, and it was wonderful. But yeah, it's not an easy thing. And so uh, the focus, I'd say, of, of, of the Vancouver Psychedelic Society has definitely not been that role. And we really see ourselves as very much a community, very socially focused. You know, we like to have these meetups and as all the things I mentioned before, hiking and going to the beach and going to festivals. Not that we're just recreational, we take it very seriously. We have, we have a lot of very close bonds that we create between each other, but we're, you know, it's just something that the that me, the leaders, Christoph in the past, haven't had like the, the energy and kind of like desire to put in that level of responsibility of like hooking people up and like feeling responsible for connecting people and everything, whatever. And it's a hard thing to do and so, it's something that Michael now is a big part of his, you know, his focus now is, is, is doing that. And so I really am so happy to have him come here to help uh, teach you all about that and kind of show, talk about his group, which is really there to help folks find places, whether you know, with, with different people. Um, he'll, he'll do a much more eloquent job of speaking about it than I will, but they have things called expansion seminars and integration circles. And, you know, it's a, it's a really wonderful thing he's doing. And to go full time on that is just something I admire a lot. So uh, I think that's really all I have to say. So Michael, thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thank, Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here to speak with you. Hopefully you can hear me. If you ever can hear me, just let me know. I'll try and raise my voice. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to try my best not to use my phone, but if you see me glancing at it, I just have a couple of notes that I took. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna try and not look at this too much. So Kenny did a wonderful job in, uh, introducing me, so thank you so much for sharing uh, with everyone a little bit about what I do. Maybe I'll spend a bit of time um, sharing a little bit more, kind of like how I got into this space and kind of my perspectives on guiding and psychedelics, just so you have an idea of who I am and like why I'm here telling you these things and also like what my perspective is on guiding. So the advice that I might give around how to find a guide might land um, properly. And so, yeah, maybe I'll just speak to that a little bit first. But first, before I get into anything, I just wanted to get a show of hands. Like, who here has tried a psychedelic before? Okay, and who here has had a guided psychedelic experience? And who here is curious about having a guided psychedelic experience? Hopefully everyone is here. <laughs> okay, awesome. Good cool. questions. <laughs> So as Kenny mentioned, my initial, just a bit, a bit of background about myself, about myself, my initial kind of introduction to the psychedelic space was through the UBC Psychedelic Society. Before that, I, you know, I used psychedelics coming out of high school, personally, and it was always for personal transformation and just personal development. I mean, initially, it was just out of curiosity. And that was kind of my line into the space. And so I ended up meeting some friends at UBC who were started the, this society, which is really awesome, because this was like five, six years ago, there's a lot more stigma. And there's this club that was actually sanctioned by UBC. So it was really cool to be a part of that and helped kind of run events and build community there on campus. And then that, like Kenny mentioned, led to working with Maps Canada. So for anyone who doesn't know about Maps, they're a nonprofit that funds research into MDMA, uh, specifically on how it can treat PTSD. And they've been around since 1986 in the US, and then Maps Canada has been around since 2011. So they're a really um, strong nonprofit here, and one of the like oldest, I'd say, like secular communities in Vancouver. They really bring a lot of people together towards a good cause. And so I worked for them, as Kenny mentioned, for a couple of years. And then during that time, and, and kind of transitioning out of Maps, um, I, I founded the Flying Sage with my sister. And so the Flying Sage is a 
started as a clothing brand actually, but now we're really focused on cycling community as well, just like the BPS is. But like Kenny mentioned, we have slightly different angles that we're taking and things that we're focusing on. And so we're, above all, we're an integration platform. So we're trying to support people on their integration process. And then around that, we, we have communities. So we have events that we run. We've done pop-ups in uh, Vancouver this summer. We did some, every Thursday, we did free pop-ups down at Kids Beach. Then we've done expansion seminars, like Kenny mentioned, which just are these, like, basically where we have talks kind of like this, where you come and just hear someone kind of speak about their perspective on certain things. And then we also run integration circles. So every other week, we have integration circles at a clinic called Chi Integrated Health, which is in Kitsilano. And those are $50, and yeah, we run those every other week, just as a way to actually bring people together after they've had psychedelic experiences, so they can talk about them in like a safe, confidential, and supportive setting and all that. So that, that's kind of what my focus has been with the Flying Sage. And as Kenny, Kenny mentioned, I'm really focusing pretty much full time on that at the moment, and along with another uh, project in my called Legacy Journeys. And so that's essentially just the brand that I created to uh, house my guiding work. And that's also something I've been doing for a couple of years now, uh, about two and a half, mainly just starting with friends. Like I would just trip sit for my friends. And then I started going to a lot of ceremonies here in the Lower Mainland and also around the world and other places learning from other um, healers, shamans, and kind of taking my own perspective on what psychedelic therapy looks like, learning from a lot of people that I would connect with through maps, and slowly but surely like having my own friends like recommend me sit for their friends, and it's kind of been a slow snowball from there. So I'm not gonna really focus too much on that. I'll maybe speak a little bit to it at the end, but I just want you all to know, like disclaimer, like that's kind of what the hats that I wear. I'm both like a psychedelic community builder and also like a practitioner myself. So I just wanted to put that out there so you know who I am and what I'm to share with. So getting into it, I wanted to just start first by asking the question, you know, why would you want to have a psychedelic guide in the first place? I think that's maybe an important place to start because I don't necessarily think everyone needs a psychedelic guide. <laughs> and I think psychedelic guided experiences have certain benefits. Um, but at the same time, a lot of you probably are psychonauts or might identify with the term. You might have experienced psychedelic psychedelics by yourself or at festivals and all these other different contexts aside from just um, like guided context, right? So I just wanted to start with, yeah, like why would someone want to work with a psychedelic guide in the first place? And so a couple points that came to mind for me and I want to share with you were around safety. So safety is really important when working with psychedelics and sometimes a guide can be really helpful in creating that safe container for you to work in. And so the way I think about it sometimes is that a guide can kind of take care of your 3D body while you're like 5D body or self <laughs> doing its thing. In, in the realms and so that's one way to think about it like your a guide is literally there to make sure that your body is safe uh, another thing that they can do is offer relational dynamics and there's probably a better term for this but what i mean by that is sometimes some of the things that we're trying to work through with psychedelics are really relational so a lot of it you know some, a lot of our problems and traumas sometimes stem back to childhood as you guys probably know right our relationship with our mother and our father can sometimes be really influential on these things but also other big uh, life um, factors too, right? Like just life events that we've experienced, things that we've been through, our certain aspects of our personality. And therapists, or I should say guides or practitioners, can be really helpful in allowing you to kind of mirror some of that experience uh, to someone else. Because when you're just working in a vacuum by yourself, you can still heal and you can still have profound experiences, but there's something really special about having a guide and having just another human being there to kind of either project onto unconsciously or consciously, or to talk to, talk through some things, like have someone that's actually trained to actually be able to navigate some of these complex issues that you might be going through. So those are some of the reasons around relational dynamics is what I mean. And so just to kind of, one more thing I wanna to add to that point is, you know, when you look at maps, for example, and the work that they're doing with research, they don't promote MDMA just by itself. They're really advocating for MDMA assisted psychotherapy and that they really put a stress on the assisted psychotherapy part. So they're not saying that MDMA by itself is gonna heal PTSD. It's actually the combination of the two things together. So having uh, two therapists in their case, that's the model that they promote, and then also the medicine together. And so I think there's something to be said about that combination. It's like having someone that can actually guide you through the experience. So that's what I mean by relational dynamics. And I'll just pause there and I'll, I will say like, if you guys have any questions along the way, I'll try and make some pauses. We'll definitely have lots of room for questions at the end, 
Um, but as we go, please do um, ask questions. We got one in the back can, there. Can I add a personal experience that's on topic? Yeah, please. So like transference is a huge thing and happens very easily in psychedelic spaces. And I've had very clear experiences of transference from my mother's stuff. But it's really clear that it's transference as opposed to outside of psychedelic spaces. It's not always clear. Like I'll have emotions that I think is about the person, but on a psychedelic trip, it's almost always super clear that the emotions that are coming up, like the person that's sitting there is, I think is my mother. Like I really think it's my mother, but I also consciously know that it's not. And that gives me a tool to be able to work with that. Can you define transference? Uh, yeah, um, transference is, um, an old emotional trauma that is stuck in your body that is then applied to someone in front of you. Is how I generally see it. So like you have some traumatic thing in your childhood that you couldn't handle, that's stuck in your body, that gets triggered and you have that big emotion come back up and then you think it's the person that's in front of you that's causing that emotion. But it's actually your that trauma memory from when you were little. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. What's your name? Wyatt. Why? Thank you, Wyatt. Okay, uh, we met through Messenger. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Nice to meet you in person. Hi, guys. <laughs> yes. I got a, maybe a statement, but kind of a question too. Just maybe for clarification, I know there's a lot of terms that are often used interchangeably. Guide, sitter, therapist, practitioner, whatever. For anyone that is not familiar, I'll just add that. Uh, yeah. Michael, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I'll definitely comment on that. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of different terminology out there and whatever, but we don't think you guys spend an hour talking just about that. So just yeah, no, it's a good distinction. Sure everyone's on the same page on that. Good distinction to make. I like to make the distinction between a trip sitter and a guide first and foremost. I think a trip sitter really can be almost anyone. It could be your friend that you ask to support you. It could be your family member, someone that you trust. Ideally, a trip sitter is someone that you trust who's there to kind of take care of you. And really, all they're kind of doing is taking care of your food and body. Like they're just making sure that nothing goes wrong. They give you some safety. Maybe some other things too, but um, I think it's important to distinguish between someone that is a trip sitter and someone that is maybe a guide. A guide is someone who's actually taking you somewhere. They're helping you move towards some sort of destination that you've hopefully clearly articulated with your intentions. So they're someone that comes into your experience, another human being that actually interweaves with your experience to some extent. It's not just you having your experience with the medicine, you actually have the presence of another person here. And that presence has a really, can either add a really uh, benefit to your experience or in, in unfortunate cases, sometimes it gets distracted from experience. So it's important to just know that you know, each of those two things. Could you wait a second? Can you just pause? Yeah, so that's right. Yeah. <laughs> trip sitter and guide and again just noting that the presence of a, a guide can really help and benefit your experience and then in the same token it can potentially also hinder your experience if you choose a poor guide or maybe someone that isn't in the ability doesn't have the ability or, or maybe position to serve as that for you so just that's a distinction i like to make some time and then Ken, kenny also mentioned other terms like you know counselor therapist like not all practitioners or guides or therapists, and I think that's an important thing to consider too. I fall under that category myself. Um, you know, their their therapists have a, a strong background with counseling therapy, and that can be really beneficial. 
uh, in certain cases, uh, but at the same time, it also isn't necessary in a guide. But that's part of what we're going to get to soon in developing your criteria for a guy that you look for. Everyone's kind of different in what they're looking for. So that's part of what we're going to discuss soon. But any other questions before we jump into some other things? Yeah? Have you found the, there's a certain type of people who don't want any assistance or therapists? Like, because you're saying there's some people who just don't want it. Like, is there... Yeah, well, I mean, like, if you're an experienced, if you're someone who's experienced with psychedelics and you're and you're wanting to go use the psychedelics in a recreational setting, for example, that's a clear example of where you wouldn't really need or want a therapist for a guide. Um, even, let's say you're wanting to explore using psychedelics by yourself. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, that's great if you have the safety, if you feel safe wanting to explore psychedelics by yourself. Solo trips. Yeah, solo trips. Yeah. That's amazing. As opposed to recreational. We can call them solo trips. Yeah, well, I mean, I feel like you can have solo recreational trips, or you can Correct, have solo yeah. <laughs> there's intentional like, trips. Yeah, right? I like to think um, like a spectrum of uh, recreational to therapeutic, and then to medical use. And like on that spectrum, we can identify like a bunch of different types of experiences. And with medical, you're pretty much always going to have some professional there that's kind of inherent in that side of the spectrum. It's like you're working with a, a clinician or a doctor or a nurse with the ketamine treatment for example um, and all sorts of things in the, in the clinical but then when you get to the other side like recreational and therapeutic those really blend together right like your experience at base coast could be recreational but it could be very therapeutic at the same time uh, so there's a blending there yeah talk about shamans as well as come across so we used to be the spiritual ones is there a category as well for shamans yeah any spiritual trips uh, do they classify that yeah so a shaman would be another example of someone that could be a guide right or could be a, a practitioner for you shamans you know is they have a certain approach typically you could say it's like an eastern approach if you want um a lot of shamans for with ayahuasca for example are, are trained to to offer that specific uh, medicine with specific cultural backgrounds and so they would be an example of like a guide i guess you could call it them that, but they probably would want to go by the name shaman or in their traditional language, whatever that, whatever their role is called, what it is about. I think I don't know if he was if that was clear enough, but I would, on top of that, I would add that you were saying there's recreational, there's therapeutic, there's med but then medical, and then for some people, there's actually like this also on top of that, there's another one that's spiritual. So like some people could also call it kind of conscious expansion, but some people call it spiritual. And there's somewhere that it just goes, feels like further. They're not. It doesn't even have to do with like as much like integration. Not like you're saying into the into the center category mm -hmm. under Michael's definitions. Yeah, it, there's so many different terms that are interchangeable. Yeah, there are definitely lots of different terms. And I mean, spiritual is a very vague word. I feel like it's uh, <laughs> for me personally. Like I would I would find spirituality in any of three of those areas. Like I think you can have a spiritual medical experience, a spiritual recreational experience, a spiritual therapeutic. No. Spirituality kind of for me at least sits at the dead of like all of it like people usually you're gonna have a spiritual experience with psychedelics it doesn't matter what setting they're in um in fact it'd be hard i think to not have a spiritual experience mystical then mystical yeah, yeah mystical. Me, for me spiritual and mystical are interchangeable but now we're just getting into semantics mm -hmm. yeah yeah but we go on spiritual it's ego death basically oneness that's what you experience right yeah like mystical mystical. experiences yeah totally relate to that and, and yeah I'd, I'd still say you know people can maybe have what would be like a uh, mystical experience with a recreational experience yeah. and they might not be prepared for that and that's where you typically have people having really challenging experiences is when they're faced with something that would be mystical but they're like they don't even know what that is yet and they're maybe not ready for that so i'll move forward just a little bit here i'm gonna what i wanted to speak about now is just you know we, we've talked about okay so asking yourself why would you want to work with a guide First, ask yourself that question first, because there's no point going to work with a guide if you don't really need to work with them. But if you've decided that, okay, the type of experience that I'm looking for, I think I would actually like to have some support in the form of uh, some sort of practitioner, whether it's a shaman, a doctor, uh, a guide, a trip sitter, then start to develop a criteria yourself. So this is something that you can still view before you even began your search. So we're just talking about what to do before looking for a practitioner or a guide. So you can start to build a criteria. And so this is a good idea, you can write it down on a piece of paper, write it down on your computer, but start to think about what are the type of things that I want in my guide. Because the, the thing you gotta understand is that there are lots of guides out there. And from the surface, you know, in Vancouver we're in a bit of a bubble, so maybe you already know that. 
but in lots of places in the world, people don't know that. They're in cities where there aren't really lots of experienced guides. Um, but here in Vancouver, there are lots of people out there doing this type of work, and you guys probably are already aware of that. So it's like, given that, you, you get the, you know, empower yourself to choose who you really want to work with. And so it's important to come up with a criteria. And so some of the first things that you can note down are like, well, what are, what, what, what are the gender or the cultural background, trauma background, and training of the person that you're working for? These are really broad categories, right? But some important things to consider. If you have a certain cultural background and you have trauma, especially linked to that cultural background, then it'll be really important. It could be really beneficial, not necessary, but beneficial for you to have someone who's experienced in that way, right? Um, and they they have that they understand that same cultural background as you, because they'll be able to walk to you farther than someone who doesn't understand that. So that's a really important piece. And then another one would be training is an interesting point to, to bring up too. Do you need someone that has been trained in certain modalities? Some people really want that. Some people don't necessarily see that as as important factor. And that's an important thing that we can talk to you. And I'm sure you guys might have some questions about that, right? Like the difference between like lived experience with medicines and training. There's lots of people that in, or fall somewhere on those spectrums and that, that are different, right? So what sort of training do you want in the person that you're gonna work with? Do you want to see a counselor? Do you feel like having someone that's a counselor will be able to benefit your experience? Then that's an important thing to put on the criteria. <laughs> and then another thing, another filter that you could add would be just word of mouth. So you know, what have you been hearing from your friends? Like, and who do you know in the community that's already doing this work? Because you know, you might find someone who has a really nice website and they have really cool offerings, but like they're no one knows them and they're just they just plop themselves and decided to do the work, right? Like they they might not necessarily be the person they want to work with. And so it's just important they might be, but you just want to get some background on them. So it's really nice to put that filter on of like word of mouth. Has this person worked with a friend of mine before? Is there people in the community that know them? What's their kind of background in the community? Another thing would be, are, like, what sort of ethical criteria are you gonna have for this guy? And so this was a point that I wanted to stay on for a moment, and maybe we can have a little discussion here at this point, because ethics is always a fun thing to discuss. And I'm part of a, um, what do they call it? It's a ethics board or ethics committee with the Canadian Psychedelic Association. So we meet like once a month to work on some documents. And so the CPA or the Canadian, or I guess it's called the PAC now, the Psychedelic Association of Canada, is uh, a, another big nonprofit in Canada that has a lot of really awesome resources. And so on this particular point, I'd really recommend you check out their resources tab and go to how to find an ethical therapist. It talks a lot about what I'm talking about today, um, but they have a specific checklist of things. I'm not gonna go through it all, but I chose some of the important ones that I think are really key to think about when you're thinking, okay, well, what sort of ethics do I want to, um, do I want my practitioner that I'm gonna work with to kind of uphold, or what are some things, other, criteria that I could look at. So I'm just gonna go over a few of those things that I borrowed from this page, and I can send it to you or show you after if anyone can't find it. Uh, but how, first of all, how do you feel around it? So that's a really important question. And it kind of gets at this idea that you should, first of all, probably meet your guide before you decide to jump into a ceremony with them. And that, some people don't do that. They like fly all the way to somewhere and they just do a ceremony with someone before they even meet them. So how do you actually feel in their presence? Like what sort of energy do they give off? or their team, like do you feel comfortable in their presence? And you can kind of get a sense of that from Zoom too, right? You can have a Zoom with someone and maybe you'll get a, a bit of a sense, you can usually do that. But obviously meeting someone in person and getting a feel for them is really great. Uh, next would be, what is their personal experience working with the medicine? So personally, I think that like kind of trumps all, like most things when it comes to working with these medicines. Like what you want in a guide is really someone who has gone there before. I like to think about it, uh, you know, it's, Think about a guide as akin to a guide here in BC, like with the mountains. Uh, we have so, so many beautiful hikes here, uh, but if you wanted to go backcountry hiking, for example, you'd probably want to go at first with a guide that's been there, right? If you want to go to some really crazy big peak and see all that there is to see, you're going to want to go with someone that has been there before and that knows the terrain really well. So I think that's a nice metaphor and analogy to use when thinking about a psychedelic guide, because the psychedelic space is is very similar, right? It's I like to think about it as like mental terrain. When you go into the psychedelic space, there's it's literally like uh, a place that we can go, and there's shared experiences there. We arguably we all kind of go to a similar place, if not the same place, when we're working with psychedelics. It's like a, a field or a state of mind that's shared and common between us Homo sapiens 
uh, when they work with these plants and uh, medicines. That was also just my opinion, so take it as you will. But um, yeah, you want someone who's been there before. So you know, ask them, like, what's your personal experience? How did you get into this? Things like that. Um, that's going to be really important. Another thing, approximately how many ceremonies treatments have they facilitated? So like, what is their experience? Uh, maybe they've worked with psychedelics themselves a lot and had a lot of experiences, but how, how many experiences have they actually facilitated with other people? Because that is a different ball game, right? That's something that's different. A big jump from just working with psychedelics to yourself to actually working and holding space for others. There's a pretty big jump there. And so maybe that's not something that you're gonna mind too much. Maybe you wanna go, your, for example, your friend who's never, um, held space for someone before, they still might be one of the best people that you could turn to, uh, depending on your experience, right? And they might not necessarily have tons of training, but in, for, in the specific example, or sorry, the specific circumstance that you might be in, they might be best suited to, to hold space for you. If you maybe, let's say you can't afford a guide and all the guides in your area are expensive, or you, um, you don't really, it's hard for you to open up to people and you only trust a small, select few people, those are just some examples of why you might turn to your friend. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, another one would be, have they done a comprehensive intake of your physical and psychological well-being? So, to put it simply, do they have an intake process? If you work with a guide and they just like, okay, yeah, next Sunday, let's do it. Like, meet me here, and here's all the information. And they don't take any time to like know you and, and like your history, then that's a bit of an orange flag. Because there's so many things to consider, like a few key important ones, like, mental health uh, conditions uh, and also me medications that you're working with, those are two like the really big, and like trauma history, I'd say those are three of the biggest things that any guide that you're working with probably should know about you. So if they're not taking initiative and asking you about that, then you should probably um, maybe look for a different guide. But yeah, that's just um, an important thing to know. You got a question? One back? of the biggest important things for me as a practitioner is what support network does my client have? Right. If they've only got me, that changes things, right? If they've got a big support network, if they're their therapist, a big community, they can do a lot more work and that changes everything. Yeah. Like, but that's also very key on my list. Yeah, totally. That's a really great uh, section, ideally, to have in an intake form that you're filling out. Like, what communities are you part of? If someone's not part of any communities and they're really disconnected, then that's going to really be, be a telling tale or telling sign for a practitioner, too. Uh, Jonathan? One of the things to add to that, that I've come aware of as well. So I also facilitate. And one of the things I started noticing more recently is uh, what kind of home situation do these people are? Are they gonna go back to a safe environment? So yeah, I was just like adding to that, like you might have a good support network, but if you go back home to an unsafe environment, then you have like a troubled relationship at home or whatever, something like that. And you're like otherwise disconnected outside of your relationship with your healer or whatever, then that could actually do more damage. You open up a lot and you go back to an environment that is such a big contrast that it might be really insane. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point to consider. Uh, you see more as like a practitioner, right? Like when you're working with a client. Yeah, yeah, it's just a, that's something like just like why it, like really like scanning out the people and like asking these kinds of questions like is it going to be safe for them where they go after the ceremony, right? Yeah, for sure. These are more like things to consider as a practitioner. So this is more like what to consider as someone looking for a practitioner, but it's obviously useful to know as someone who's well, yeah, for, that question for a guide, right? Prompts you to think about like, what is my condition? Yeah, right. what, what communities am I surrounded with? Like, what does my household look like? What is my family situation? And these are all things that are gonna impact your experience with working with psychedelics. Yeah? What is the starting point in Yellow Book or any Google or how do we start? Uh, start? Great question, we're just about to get to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, two more. Yeah, two more things I wanted to mention. So criteria that you can add, or just things to consider before you go searching for your guide. First, uh, would they agree to arrange for you to talk to one of their previous clients? That's kind of a, a nice thing that if they if they have pre had previous clients and, and, and worked well with them, that would that should be a fine thing to ask. Um, so potentially reach out to your guide about that before working with them. And then finally, are they part of a peer support group themselves? So this is an important one, I think. A lot of the issues that I've seen happen in the psychedelic space or heard about happen in the psychedelic space with practitioners or guides or therapists or whatever you want to call these people um, typically happens when you have like a facilitator who's working in isolation and they don't have support. And that makes sense, right? Like when we're alone, sometimes we mess up and we don't have the support of the community. We maybe sometimes get lost. 
even if we might have been trained really well to do, do the work a certain way, if we don't have someone to hold us accountable or someone to check in with, sometimes in any profession, um, that can be unfortunate, right? And that's why you have in other professions, like other wellness professions, like whether it's chiropractic or you know, even physicians, like usually they have colleagues, right, that they talk with and work with. And that can really be beneficial. But if you have a, a psych, because psychedelics is underground, still largely to a, a big degree, you still have a lot of people that are working in isolation. So asking the guide, who are, like, who do you work with? Like, do you have a community or peer support group? That can just be a, a nice telling sign. Like, if they're kind of stunned and like, oh, like, what's that? Then that's, a, might be a good idea to just maybe, not necessarily don't work with them, but maybe just think about that. And then finally, what kind of integration and aftercare and also pre-sessions are being offered? That's a really important thing too. When you're working with a guide, you don't really wanna just find someone that's offering just a session, like the medicine day, like you really wanna have someone that's gonna support you um, both before and after. And I'd say, you know, maybe there's some exceptions to that sometimes, but like usually if you're, you know, especially if you're, you're paying a guide to help you and, and really take you where you wanna go, then it's important that they take the time to build trust and that's, can really only be achieved if you haven't met them before through preparatory sessions. And it's important that they help you to ground the insights that you have gained or just the experience that you've had after. So really look for people that have offerings there that will complement the experience itself. So that's everything around the criteria. Any questions about that? I just want to emphasize the point about finding people who can support you afterwards. Like, it is absolutely possible to have a very traumatic experience on psychedelics that, and then to not have those people there to help you with it afterwards, especially given that they might have been uh, someone that you were uh, transferring onto in the in the the ceremony or the the session. Uh, yeah, that can just go really, really bad. Totally. Yeah. yeah thank you for speaking to that. And it goes to Julian's point too, right? Like, depending on what your household is like, you know, if you go back to you might have it, whether you have a challenging or profound or blissful experience in your psychedelic state, it doesn't matter really what it is. If you go, it's gonna be starkly different than sometimes what your experience is at home. And if you, sometimes there can be a big contrast there that can be a little bit discomforting and just destabilizing. And so part of the integration process is helping to stabilize after you've gone on a big flight. It's like taking the rocket, right? You kind of need something to stabilize you when you come back down. Um, and so yeah, that's really important. Thanks for speaking to that, Daniel. Um, any other questions on that? Yeah? Do you make sure or are you wary of their expectations? I don't know, maybe you've mentioned it. Because sometimes people have maybe unrealistic expectations that, you know, this session is going to, you know, fix everything. Yeah, as a practitioner, you should be mindful of your client's expectations. Yeah. And then as someone going into an experience, as a participant, you should be mindful of your expectations and try not to confuse intention with expectation. That's really important. Mm -hmm. You know, what your your intentions for the experience should be shouldn't really be what you expect to get out of it. And there's nuance to pull away there. Um, but that's something that we just have to do as like a, like a reflective practice going into an experience is really making sure to distinguish those two. Yeah, answer your question. Yeah, how do you distinguish the two? How do you distinguish the two? For me, what I like to encourage people to do who are coming into a session is to, with their intentions, focus more on how they want to show up in with the medicine, as opposed to like what they want to get out of it. Oftentimes you, you have people, sometimes you have people come with like a laundry list of like, I want to have this and this and this and this and this and this. And, this. and like, that's a great starting point, right? But in general, I think intentions, it's nice to, it's nice to focus intentions down and crystallize them into something concrete. So a simple suggestion I would have would be to bring your intentions to a word doesn't have to be an adjective, it could be anything, but just make it simple instead of having really complex intentions. That that will make it easier to remember and hold on to because ultimately going into an experience, an intention I think in some ways is something that you want to let go of before you actually go into experience. I think the intention period is really important. It has lots of important functions for thinking about what your intentions are and what you do want to get out of the experience and 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 how you hope that it will go. And talking about that of course is, is great. But then when it actually comes to sitting with the medicine, I think it's important to kind of let go of that intention instead of holding on to it really tight because you never really know what's going to happen, right? And sometimes people, when they hold on to intention so hard, they they they're then like forcing the experience to funnel through a very small aperture, where really you can open things up more to allow it to show up in surprising ways. Because sometimes 
you might have heard the saying like you'll you might not get what you expect but you'll get what you need something along those lines psychedelics typically work like that um, so i hope that answers your question basically the two things would be simplify your intention choose something like a, even a simple word or adjective and then focus more on how you want to show up with medicine as opposed to what you want to get what does that mean how you want to show up like how do you want to appear how do you want to show up when you have so you've just ingested five grams of mushrooms like how do you want to do that like how what, what emotions do you want to show up with the day of do you want to be do you want to be scared when you're doing that do you want to be open um, do you want to surrender to the experience do you want to do it with trust like in what way would you carry yourself into that situation that's kind of how I think about it does that answer your question Sort of. Yeah. Can we use? Can you give an example? Let's like have client A's intention is blank, their expectation is blank. That would be a good way, right now. Like, can you? Is there an example? You know what I mean? Can you give an example of an expectation of a person? Well, yeah. Like someone's expectation might be to like solve their relationship with their mom. Hmm. Like they're like, I want to come out of this and just everything is rosy with my mom. Okay. And then their, so that's the. And their intention, and then what would their intention be? Because they're different, two separate things, right? Their intention could, could be to explore, even just simply changing the word framing, right? Of the words, like to explore one's relationship with their mom, or to explore family. Simply that, explore family. Or the root. That way, it's not it's not pinned to a result. It's more of just like a way. Again, it's like how you want to show up with the medicine. It's like I want to explore, or I want to be curious about this. Sometimes even just reframing the way that you say it, the intention can be helpful. Does that help? Semantics a little bit, yeah. Yeah, well it is kind of semantics. Yeah. Yeah. It's like semantics. Expectation and intention, right? They're just words and they're similar but different. I think that the intention that Michael has to like, <laughs> is, but I, and from my own experience is, yeah, again, if, if you say, if you set I mean, I think there's a big difference between saying, I am curious about how I can improve the relationship with my mother versus I want everything to be rosy after I get, after these mushrooms wear off. Like that's a huge difference. Yes. Yeah. And I've fallen into it myself. You see the headline, one, one, one trip cures depression. Yeah. It's very easy to go with an expectation of this thing will fix it. After yeah, five years of doing this mom. work, I can tell you it's not a one trip. That's yeah, that's I guess there's rare exceptions, but yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, so, so back to your point now, starting your search, like where do you actually begin? Now you have some idea of who you want in a guide, you've decided that you want a guide and you decided who they kind of want to be, what qualities they want to have, so how do you actually start searching for a guide? Um, where are some places that you can look? Well, you guys are already here in a great space to start. The Vancouver Psychedelic Society is a great example of a psychedelic community which would be my first point. So seek a psychedelic community, and if you have other people that are looking for psychedelic guides, I typically always first say, look for a psychedelic community in your area. Vancouver, we're pretty blessed to have so many different psychedelic communities. Like I can literally probably count several psychedelic communities in Vancouver, including Flying Sage, including BPS and others. Um, but in other parts of the world, people aren't that lucky yet. Uh, it's still up growing, right? But try and find psychedelic communities, and what I would say is a helpful tip there is Usually there was like a psychedelic society for a city, so that, like the Vancouver Psychedelic Society is an example. You have the Toronto Psychedelic Society, Montreal Psychedelic Society. And then oftentimes, especially in the early days, these societies were linked to a university. So I think the first psychedelic society was UBC Psychedelic Society in Vancouver. I mean, technically, like Maps Canada was the first maybe psychedelic community. I'm actually, and that's not true, because I know there's all these older psychedelic communities that I had no idea about that have run their course and done their thing, but the ones that I know about, I'm speaking to here. But yeah, if you're in a city that doesn't have a visible psychedelic society, go to the university and see what type of research they're doing there. Sometimes their community starts with the research, and that's where you can f first find people. And so I'd recommend that, but since you're all here in Vancouver, we've got some specific resources for you. So starting with the VPS, like if it's your first time here, like check out uh, the Discord channel that Kenny mentioned meet other people in the community, because there's, there's a certain amount of people here, but there's way more people on the meetup group. You guys have like 1,100 people or something on the meetup group, and then you've got however many people in the Discord channel, like go in there, like just introduce yourself, maybe share like what you're looking for, and then who knows, someone's gonna jump in and like give you a suggestion, right? Um, I wanted to mention 
the Flying Sage. So that's the organization that I mentioned that I started a couple of years ago. And one of the things that we've really have been focusing, like Kenny mentioned, is this process of helping people find a guide. So one resource I want to share with you is a database that I've created. So I created this database of cycle up guides for Vancouver, and we also have one started for the island, Vancouver Island. But we have quite a few, I think 24, 25 guides on there right now. These are all people that I've talked to or know or vetted to some extent to be on this um, practitioner database. And it's still a work in progress, and it's hopefully gonna get better over time. But right now you can go on there, you can see a list of practitioners, their names, their emails, their website, their contact information, what uh, modalities they work with, what their background is, and what medicines they work with. Now you just have to click on the person's name and then open up a window to see the medicines. I've kind of hidden it from the actual What's table. The it's called, the, if you look at the Flying Sage, you'll find that. Flying Sage? The Flying Sage. Flying Sage. Yeah. I'm, I'm planning on, I actually, as we're going through, I'm gonna send an email afterwards with like an outline of the, the points and stuff that you did and including links. So don't Thanks, feel like you'll have to feverishly write these things down. <laughs> I feel like I just created a guide here of like how to do it and I should just send that to people so I don't have to mm. transcribe it on their yeah, I'll probably also post this on an article or something, and then it'll also link everything. So you should be able to find everything on, a, on an article. I just had that thought when I walked up here. <laughs> Since I, it's all here anyway, so. Um, Michael, yeah. I'll, I'll put Generally speaking, do you have to bring your own sage <laughs> to the, these, these practitioners? That's an interesting question. Um, no, I'd say. I think it, they I think, will provide? Well, it's a specific thing, but it's a general thing. Like most practitioners probably have sage if they have some ceremonial aspect to themselves. Maybe if you might have to bring your own sage if you wanted to go to get a ketamine treatment done at a clinic. That being said, <laughs> that's that, that, I thought that sage was, was general, code I, word for. That, that being said, um, so was this, uh, she yeah, integrated health. Oh, we're not talking yeah, about sage? No, no. I, Are we talking about sage or? <laughs> well, his, his name is Flying Sage, right? But sage is also an herb, right? But then I'm just talking about like some people think that the practitioners are going to have the stuff there that you want to go on, right? And is that a reality or is that not a reality? Maybe you have to bring your own ketamine or you have to bring your MDMA, MDMA right? Oh, so, sorry. So you're using sage as a cover for second. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the next section of the talk. Okay. Yeah, no. I thought you had actually sage. Yeah, I thought you were talking about sage too. It's, it's really common to like sage in ceremony. Yeah, that's so why. Like that's what I thought as well. Yeah. So regarding these medicines, I'd say that's something that you would talk to your the guide about, usually in like your initial call or your intention session. Like I'd say typically most of the time the guide is always gonna off is gonna have medicine for you. I'd say in a rare case that they don't, and sometimes they might even say on their website that they don't, but in, in reality they probably do. Um, so yeah, I think it's the rare exception where people don't have medicine. And just tangent, the flying sage has nothing to do with sage, the herd. <laughs> Uh, sage, sage in, in philosophy is someone who's attained wisdom, and so a flying sage is someone who has attained wisdom using psychedelics because they're flying and they're high. I'm very new to Canada CMT, so what are the legalities regarding those? Okay, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Lots of gray area, which is great. Yeah, yeah. Slash not and gray. I've been to a few different countries now, but then most of the world or but. I haven't um, experienced or heard of this in any other country. Yeah, sorry, what was the last thing you said? I said I've been to a few countries, like uh, New Zealand, Germany, and from right. South Africa myself. So I haven't heard of this type of practice in any of those countries. Uh, is it something that's quite common, or is it? Like the, the practice of working with psychedelics? Yeah, yeah, it's, and with the practitioner. Yeah, it's not quite, I wouldn't say it's common yet. It's getting there slowly, but like I said, Vancouver is quite a bubble. Yeah. There's been a lot of work done in Vancouver over the years with psychedelics, but there's also lots of other bubbles, like San Francisco is a bubble. Um, the Netherlands is kind of its own funky bubble, mm -hmm. like Amsterdam in particular. Um, New Zealand, I think it's pretty, like it's illegal there, so there's, yeah, there's yeah, nothing to be done there. there. There isn't anything else. Or at least I haven't nothing, seen it in four nothing years. Nothing visible, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I was saying, most cities in the world, it's still very much underground and illegal. Mm -hmm. Pretty much all the substances that you'd want to work with are still illegal in Canada. Mushrooms are in this weird gray zone. They're being, they're like uh, legal to use in certain settings. Like you can apply to get a, a what's called a Section 56 exemption from the government. And Health Canada can like grant people permission to use psychedelics, or sorry, psilocybin <coughs> mushrooms for end of life distress and other things. Theracil is a really cool organization that's doing lots of work there. And a few others, 
and also you can go to a dispenser here in Vancouver. There's quite a few dispensaries now, like four or five, that you can go and just openly buy mushrooms. So in Vancouver, the police have said, and I can find this document for people if you're interested, but they stated explicitly that they're not going to enforce or criminalize people using mushrooms. Like they're basically just like, well, this isn't our priority. They kind of de facto criminalized it, but it's still not legal in, in Canada. Yeah. Cannabis is, is obviously legal in Canada. Uh, and then other psychedelics, 5-MeO DMT is a kind of this weird gray zone too. Like I think it's kind of technically considered a food. And it's like, it's, it's, uh, it's managed under like the Food and Drug Administration. But yeah, it's just like in this weird zone where it's, it's, um, it's not, like I think the, you can't sell it, but you can possess it. Um, and then the regular DMT is I think schedule one, I think, um, yeah, I'm not, I don't know all like the jargon and all the details, but most psychedelics are illegal. Probably other people here that could give you more, maybe specific details on that. But LSD illegal, 3 MC illegal. Yeah. You can buy them there. Uh, why? <laughs> oh, you can buy them in Vancouver about a month ago. ago, uh, it finally got passed for the uh, decriminalizing all small possession of all drugs in Vancouver. Yeah. All small possession all easy. Starting January. January. Yeah, January. Yeah, January. Yeah. January. Yeah. January. Yeah. January. Yeah. Starting January. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and it's like up to five small possession. Two and a half grams. Two and a half grams? Oh, so so like, five, of what? Know, anything? They, they, anything. They, they wanted four and a half, like, two and a half grams of. We have two and a half grams of LSD. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't take anywhere near that. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, no, it's, it is. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely a great first step. Yeah. We'll get there. For sure. Did you have a question too in the back, or was that the same, same thing? Did you have a question too? No, I was just gonna. Like, same, uh, same thing. Yes, yeah, same thing. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah. Any other questions? Just yeah. comment. I was really surprised. I was coming out of downtown East Side, and on the left-hand side of Hastings Street, there was a shop. And oh, I went in there, me. and it was just like I got peyote there. Right? Yeah. Was just yeah. Like, yeah. Really? You, 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 know, like, you, you bought it? Yeah. Yeah. I bought it. Yeah. You're good. Yeah. But I, you know, just, stack size? I was surprised. Stack size or the whole plant? <laughs> no, that would have been interesting to make the whole plant. But I don't know. I just, I just wanted to have a case. Maybe one day I wanted to try it. But it was just, I was surprised that they had. Peyote is legal. Is it legal? Is it legal because they're the Christian group? Oh, because yeah, they're religious. No, 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 it's not legal. Yeah. It's only legal for them to use. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So anyway, so you have to get back on track. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can talk a lot about the the, the, my, the, uh, the subtleties with the legalization. But yeah, or, Justin, go ahead. Can I just mention, like, yes, they're technically legal and they're kind of decriminalized, but we have mushroom dispensaries and cocoa leaf cafe like openly advertising that we're selling LSD and and and, 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 and what mushrooms and San Pedro and whatever. It kind of just gives you an idea that in Vancouver the authorities generally are very relaxed about this. So obviously, it's still your own risk. But the general attitude is, you're pretty safe. Like if you don't do them on the streets or whatever, you do it discreetly over the guy, you're probably gonna be fine. That's just my opinion, right? But it feels very safe and relaxed, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. so, this is my opinion. Yeah. Everyone that is any on video, please uh, knock it down. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just your opinion, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just your opinion. Just your opinion. You want to say that more clearly. <laughs> 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 so we talked a lot about the criteria that you built. So once you found this. If you're using the database that I created or other means, like reach out to a practitioner and like just start to ask questions. A lot of practitioners will have like a free uh, discovery call, they might call it, or like just a free call where you get the chance to meet them. So take advantage of that, like, and don't like know that you have a lot of practitioners out there. So set up a bunch of calls. You don't have to go with the first person that you find, right? Set up a bunch of calls, feel out who you would want to work with, and I think that would be a, to answer your question. Like a good first place to start is take your criteria that you have, just have it as notes. And then use that, have that beside you as you're talking to um, different practitioners and have those questions ready that you want to ask. Because um, uh, those are all important things to, to bring into a conversation with a guy. And so aside from that database, the one that I mentioned, there's a couple other databases too. M most of them are focused on the states and that's actually why I created the Flying Sage one because it's not really, there's not really a one that's focused on Canada too much. Although MAPS, if you search up MAPS integration list, they had one of the first ones that's public and they st it's still there, but I'm not sure if they update it actively. I think it's just kind of like historic now, but you can search geographically, you can find Vancouver and they also have some like, theirs are all like NAs 
for uh, therapists, like people that are, have a credentials. So their database is purely focused on that. The third wave is a great resource in general for lots of things. They also have a, da a database that people don't necessarily know about. But again, that's mostly focused on the US. But if you're looking for a guide in the US, check out the third wave. And then psychedelic.support also is a good resource. They also have a database. Um, you can check out theirs as well. And they have some practitioners in Canada, but again, mostly focused on the States. Um, so you can use those uh, databases to search, but just keep in mind, most of those databases only include people that have training, which is great, but there's also lots of guides in Vancouver, for example, that I know that don't have training, but are still skilled guides. A lot of people that I've worked with, in fact, some of the, in my opinion, some of the most skilled guides I've worked with don't have the formal, like they don't have a master's um, or something like that. Uh, yeah. How would you like really find out if you're gonna get results or not from somebody? Like they're not gonna have this Google five star, are they? Like, like, like do you know yeah, what I mean? It makes sense. Like, no, but like, how? Just how look for testimonials. 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 Yeah. yeah so that's why you want would to. Would you look for like yellow flags? Like, how would you know someone doesn't vibe with you right away? Like, from their website. And yeah, how would you know you're you're getting something out of this? But also results is. I don't know about that as a. Well, that would be. What does that mean? Yeah. Like, how do you? You may get not, terrible well, results. You know, you yeah. could have a, I, well, I not from have the, a well, that, traumatic you can have, yeah, experience. You can have traumatic experiences, but, but the, the person who's helping you, the facilitator, it, you know, we, so that's the thing where it's like, that's, there's your body and then your mind and then the facilitator could do a really good job. They can be like really talented at what they do. They can handle it good. They can give you your space, but they could just be awful, right? They could not ask you all those questions they couldn't they could not prepare they could like not, they could be irresponsible at many things and be responsible at very few things so right yeah and then sometimes they can have like five stars because they had five clients who were all in their same genre right like oh my gosh i love christine she played drake music when i was super high and we did a lot of like hip-hop stuff and yeah. we had hip-hop lingo but then someone else goes in there like holy cow <laughs> You know, like we don't know. Right? I don't even like yeah, your yeah, yeah. I thought you meant results I'm gonna, from this. I'm just gonna read things back because I want to be mindful of time. Um, it's 7:07 now, so I just want to. I can uh, come back to your question maybe after and share some specific things with you. My one suggestion there was to just like reach out to their past clients and try your best. Obviously, it's not going to be perfect. We're not. We don't live in a world where there is a Yelp for like <laughs> guys yet, but maybe in the future we will. Yeah, soon enough we will. Um, so just a couple things like next steps. I would encourage you to yeah schedule a time to meet with your guide ahead of time and ideally make this in person um, and discuss all details of the ceremony that you want to have with them until you feel comfortable. And don't move forward until you feel really comfortable with this person. And so ask them lots of questions. Um, those are most of my thoughts on how to find a guide. I hope that it's helpful. There's a couple last little tips I want to share. Don't rush into an experience with anyone. Be really mindful um, of having a journey with your partner. So if you're looking to do like a, a joint journey and just be mindful that you don't like interweave your experiences I can I can speak more of that maybe after this um, just being mindful of bringing your own things into an experience uh, learn more on your own about any substances that you want to work with don't rely on a, a guide to tell you about a substance if you've never heard about it before do your own research and then finally don't spend too much time reading trip reports I find that a lot of people's po uh, the experiences that they post are usually like experience they had with really bad set and setting uh, so don't take everything that you see on the internet uh, as like a face value. So I'll maybe wrap it up there. And do we have time for more questions? No. Any any particular questions? Like we'll, we'll have this. We're going to break up into small groups. There'll be a lot of time to ask questions there. But I'll, I think one or two last ones. If not, we'll wrap it up there. Okay. So how somebody wants to become a guide? What do you suggest? The path. That's a great question. There is lots of options nowadays which is great I think one of the one good way is to work shadow other psych experienced psychedelic practitioners and ask them directly so ask them what they suggest and work directly with them there's different trainings that you can take some are really like small some of them are online some of them are more extensive um, Phoenix Academy is an example of one that I haven't done yet but I've heard really good things about it's BC based now and and there's also lots of other schools like California Institute of Integral Studies is a heavy hitter. They do a lot of really great stuff and have been for a long time. Esalon Institute, these are all like maybe in the States, but um, in Canada, there's other options that are emerging too. So just yeah, seek out training and seek out other facilitators with experience. Do you see that uh, profession being regulated in the future? 
Sorry? By being regulated in the future, do you see that happening? Regulated? No. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah, I see it happening, like most things. Yeah. And I'm trying to steer that in a, in a direction that allows for all sorts of different types of guys. Yeah. Just, uh, I'll take a stab at that one as well. Just the, it looks like the first step of any kind of regulated, legalized thing in term, at wide scale, obviously. Darasil was mentioned as Section 57 exemption and, and the special access program is happening in Canada. It's a very, very specific one-off one approvals, but um, if you've heard of Rick Doblin and MAPS, uh, they have a plan to have FDMA for PTSD, uh, you know, legal, you know, getting rolling next year or, or 2024. So uh, that will probably be the first large scale uh, psychedelic related kind of legal medical work. So that's the probably the first big, the, the first big step, I'd say. So anyway, um, as mentioned, we're going to break up the small groups in a minute. But um, again, I just want to thank Michael so much for, for coming and talking to you.